This week, we passed the five-year anniversary of Tahrir Square, but do we even know or care what's happening there now? Do we see the parallels between what's happening here and what's happened there? We will speak with an Egyptian activist who sets the record straight on the past and the present. Next up, this is the week to stand strong on the front lines against the complete corporate takeover. And finally, this lowlife scum is not something that you can see, taste, or have probably even heard of. But it's poisoning more than half of our country. And here's what you can do about it. But first, allow me to not be polite, but poetic. Not polite, but poetic. Pathetic how we really just let this continue like we couldn't shift this, lift this, oppression, progression, a dementia, dimension where none of us seem to remember or mention that greed didn't use to mean keys to the cities in this, the land of the free. No, I won't sugarcoat as we reach for the rope, a collective campaign to fit us with chains, smiles, and shakes. Where do I sign on this dotted line? I would prefer mine to be blue. Oh, Red, whatever. It's really up to you. I'm just here for the ride. The sludge slip and slide. The do as you're told, never mind. Just here to filter the crazy off-kilter. Balance depends on how far you lean. Truth is a shade, not red, white, or blue, that I've never seen. The sheen of true lies shines bright, and the sparkle is mesmerizing. Curled up in here, a clear, whitewashed and gleaming with fear, this cozy cocoon of echoing fools is safe, warm. Out there it's a mess, or so I'm told. It's cold and alone, without chains there to guide you. How will you know which way to go? Battered and beat by the sleet, the wind, no reprieve. A corporate tool powered by greed, powering weather that's no longer seen. The seasons are changing, but not as they should be. Back there in the hole, the cozy kept moles appreciate warming and do as they're told. And for those of us, you, crawling from early graves, dug for your minds and your souls, Dig in. Feel the cold dirt neath your fingers and grasp. Grasp that the worst of it all is that you're taught to fall. Grasp that the future is this way and echoes are made to sound louder the longer they pass. Grasp the man blasting demons and threats as you move is there because he's scared of what you will do if you crawl up to stand. Then walk and move past the old world machine whirring and whirling, the ruse now unfurling, the formerly blind in your swaddling hole now knows... There's a point just a few feet away, through a blast of the shock and the cold that holds truth. Bare and naked, not sugar-coated, not polite, but poetic. Not heroic, prophetic, just honest. Not always simple, but straight. And here at this gate, between cozy comas and lucid free moments, the dirt on your nails is the wind in your sails, the tired and cold is your pride. Now hold onto it and survey the scene without that fake sheen. Check your surroundings and see. See how long it's been since you've really seen reality. The simple machine that word stirred up your fears and kept you at bay with the dwindling rights that they might take away a rusted old piece, not the horrendous crazed beast that they told you to lay outside. The lines that they drew to keep you in line, like an old metal fan, the man standing behind, guiding the push of cold air, as those peeking from holes, if they dare, scare and shrink down. Then he moves on with creaking and star-spangled sounds, the storm nothing more than that cold air ghost and a good PR boast. The short, simple distance from one to the next, from where they had made that simple warm nest to where you stand now laughably close, made to seem so much more in that prison hole. Not miles of pain unprotected, insane, just a step. Really, just a step. And the man standing small, protected by all he projected, now just as bare as the truth is once so rare. He warns you to not keep on moving. The danger is great. Dissenters are losing. Get back to your hole, back to your cage where it's safe, and we know you'll be saved. But you've taken that step. You've left that squat space, the cozy small hole, now just empty abyss. And this, this new way forward, this way that still echoes with the footsteps of those who decided the chains and holes are not where you're safe, not where you hope, not home for the free or the brave. From slaves to yippies, the out-of-liners, fighters, and occupiers, their marks are still here in the sand. The line that was drawn by the man with the plan, the man with the rusty old fan, smudged by the morals that just wouldn't budge. Look back at the dirt you now dragged. To hear right now where you stand, look how you spoiled that gleaming facade, spoiled that pristine mirage. You cannot go back to that hole. The only way home 
is to walk the unknown. You're not alone. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. I realize that it's been quite a while since I threw out a quote of the day, so before we dive onto the front lines and activist news of the week, let's get some wisdom and inspiration from a powerful front lines point of view. Diaries of an Unfinished Revolution is a fucking brilliant, moving, tempestuously powerful compilation, a lot of three-syllable words, of eight first-person accounts from the front lines of the Arab Spring. Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Yemen, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. Something that struck me immediately as I began reading this book was the amount of parallel. The mirrored scenes between what I've seen as an activist in this country and what these activists describe in the years and months leading up to their respective mass uprisings. January 25th marked the five-year anniversary of the Egyptian Revolution, and as the press made a vague hearkening back to Tahrir Square, it felt appropriate, as we like to do on this show, to dig a little deeper than a commemorative headline. In the book, Yasmin el-Rashidi, a Cairo native, describes her home before the revolution. She describes a city waiting waiting for change, but not yet at the tipping point, not yet placing their purpose in the political upheaval of a generation, finding themselves instead in a suspended state of apathy and quiet despair. Over the years, as I traveled back and forth, it seemed as if the population I had known had taken to the streets out of sheer listlessness, a peaceful expression of lack of bidun. There was an increasing lack of jobs, of opportunities, of possibilities for a better life, an absence of hope. The government was promising reforms, privatizing, implementing wide-scale programs intended to boost the economy and improve quality of life. The indicators suggested that indeed the future was bright. But the reality, away from the numbers, was objection. Abject poverty, abject despair, despair so deeply ingested in the psyche of Egyptians it had turned over the years into an apathy palpable even in the city's air. In many ways, this was a population inert, sinking deeper and deeper, and I found myself floating, listlessly, restlessly, aimlessly, burdened by my own self as well as the story of the city. Yasmin wrote this about a year before what we consider to be the Egyptian Revolution began. Apathy, it seems, this subdued discontent, a complaining cabbie, a disgruntled family member, these are like the psychological warning signs for a populace on the verge of a break. Breakthrough, breakdown, maybe both at the same time. And Yasmin writes, the closer it got to the breaking point, the more shifts you started to see. Small at first, another few people at a protest, another step too far by a police officer. And once Tahrir Square filled, it didn't herald the end of an uprising, the pinnacle. It was just another point on that dissenting timeline. In other words, what happened in Egypt didn't just happen. It's still happening. It is those marks in the sand still being made. Yasmin makes it a point to write that there wasn't just one moment, there wasn't just one day or one person or decision that pulled thousands into the square, that turned the non-political into revolutionaries. It was years of that quiet discontent, years of apathy that couldn't sustain itself on a diet of empty, of meaning and future. It was the small actions, the small rallies, the inability to ignore just how bad shit was, no matter how many ads and propaganda that the government threw at people. And as you'll hear in a moment, what is still happening too is a continuation of these issues, the problems, the discontent, the hope and hopelessness, and the deep-seated corruption. These movements aren't a moment, to borrow a line from Black Lives Matter. These movements are ongoing, in Egypt and here in the U.S. So, how will our own quiet discontent, our own apathy play out? How will those small actions, events, and movements decide a breaking point, a breakthrough, a breakdown? Will we have a Tahrir Square? Will our military take over the, the way they have in Egypt? Can we look at Egypt's trajectory and learn something? Write our own course. Consider things that we might not have thought of or thought to consider. In short, yes, we can. And Salma Hussein insists that we must. Salma Hussein, which is not her real name, by the way, is an Egyptian activist currently in the United States for a short speaking tour. She spoke to us late, late last week about the Egypt we don't know, past and present. 
She asked us to blur her face because, as she says, things in Egypt aren't good. She could be thrown in jail for dissenting, for writing on her blog, Quest for Justice, about her experiences, her hopes, sharing her free-thinking mind and her list of issues with the status quo in Egypt. Not least of all, the continued U.S. military backing. For us, it might be hard to imagine a situation where we would need to blur our own faces or adopt a fake name in order to tell foreign press the realities of living in this country. But it is in fact a reality that some political prisoners have already faced in this country. And it is one of many things that we must consider when looking at the parallels between two countries, both filled with a populace stretched by inequality, injustice, and corruption. Take a look. I want to talk to you about the, the Egyptian military, because as an activist in the U.S., something that we think about a lot is if we were to have something like the Egyptian revolution happen here, our military be being as large as it is, having them come in is a, is a fear that a lot of activists have. Uh, can you talk a bit about how, what the role of the Egyptian military has been in the revolution back in 2011, but also now? Egypt has been a military dictatorship, basically. The military controls close to 15% of the economy in the country. So it's not just a uh, military, it's a military industrial complex. And then with the 1950s coup, the, the officers and the military maintained powers within all of the civilian institutions. So when the revolution happened, it was a threat for all of these interests, political and economical and everything else. So the military had to maintain its interest and in, uh, power. There was a discourse at the beginning that I've seen in all of the international media that the Egyptian military supported the revolution or whatever. Um, and for some time, that's what a large number of people, even within the movement, believed until the military started to show a different attitude towards the movement with cracking down on journalists and activists and anybody who's trying to expose these violations. That started from the very beginning. And then with um, towards 2013, a year after the first president was elected, the military overthrew the president and took over completely. Right now, after a military general um, won the presidential elections in 2014. Um, it seems like the military is the only player in the political scene in Egypt. So any voices of dissent, any, um, any other discourse or narrative or analysis other than what the military has to say or believes or wants people to believe is not allowed in the public arena. You have to be very careful about who you're talking to, what you're saying, what you're writing. People are getting attacked and arrested um, for writing things online. Um, the protests are more outside of the major cities, like not in Cairo or Giza or any of the big cities, mostly in the Delta and Upper Egypt and the South, somewhere in the countryside. Um, and yeah, I think things are very, very different in comparison to how they looked like a few years ago. Um, just in the past few months, like the number of people I personally know who got arrested or stopped at the airport or picked up from their homes or universities has been, um, has increased dramatically. And, and as you wrote on, on your blog, you wrote about um, a, a female activist who was found dead in her apartment. Um, and you say that this is, uh, this is a part of the problem. It's not just that you have a revolution and you're done. There's a lot of depression and, and hopelessness that comes after, particularly because of, of what's happened there. And it seems particularly um, oppressive for women. Can you talk a little bit about that? It was very disheartening for me to read about that incident uh, of that woman that was found hanged in her apartment. Um, and I feel like I could relate, and so many people I know like could definitely relate to her experiences. Like After five years of um, struggling and organizing and 
seeing that nothing's changing and things are getting worse and then hearing about all of the violations that are happening to other women in prisons and feeling like you can't really do much about it. And specifically with how the media coverage has been, like the international media specifically has been ignoring what's going on in the past couple of years. So what is what is your plan now as, as somebody who has been part of this for the past five years and of course before that too, uh, being that you, you lived in Egypt? I have continued from the very beginning of the uprising to try to offer the missing perspective and the missing stories and the stories that get lost in translation. It's very frustrating for me to be a witness to two different worlds that don't know anything about each other. And to see that the people who get portrayed in the Western media um, do not represent me and do not represent the people I work with and the people I associate with. So I always try to offer that perspective and find the opportunities, whether through writing or speaking or connecting people from Egypt and the U.S. and other countries with each other and having people learn about what's going on through personal communication and experiences. So... Um, I'm here for a short amount of time, and I still don't know what's going to happen next. Um, I had friends who were arrested upon returning home for speaking outside. So what I continue to do is try to build these bridges and look at the other humane sides of the uprising and not just look at the politics involved or the political analysis or the government or elections or whatever, like, look at these people who are part of the movement as individuals with feelings and experiences and traumas, um, and try to highlight that. So finally, um, just a, just a last, a last question before, uh, before you head out. Um, what, what do you feel that the, that activists in the U.S., what do, if you could if you could tell activists in the U.S. that are also fighting for freedom and justice, what would you tell them as a word of advice, considering that our our military issue is much the same? I think that there's so much education that needs to happen. Um, people need to humble themselves and they need to open their minds and look at perspectives and analysis that might not be familiar to them. The U.S. continues to support. The Egyptian state, like, and that goes back to a long time ago, since the 1970s with the Camp David Accord. And the U.S. looks at Egypt only as a strategic partner in the Middle East. Um, and the military aid continues to flow regardless of the internal situation or the human rights uh, situation or economical development or educational level. Um, so people should be aware uh, and they should learn more about the specifics of how that works. Um, the continuous support uh, from the U.S. administration, all the money that could go to um, support development here in the U.S. locally. Um, I think that's important. For more information on Salma and to read her first-hand accounts of life in Egypt then and now, check out her blog and quest for justice at inalllanguages.blogspot.com. Now, moving on, let's visit the front lines for more on the fight against corporate control. So I mentioned to you last week that this week is a big push against TPP. In fact, today and tomorrow specifically. Here in D.C., there's a gathering and rally outside the White House organized by Flush the TPP, whom we've mentioned many times before. Margaret Flowers, founder of Flush the TPP and also current Green Party candidate for U.S. Senate in Maryland, gave us a quick rundown of what these actions mean, what the TPP means, and next steps. She writes... On Wednesday, the U.S. Trade Ambassador Michael Froman will sign the Trans-Pacific Partnership for President Obama at a casino in Auckland, New Zealand, with leaders from the other 11 TPP countries. This starts the two-year time clock within which each of the countries must ratify the TPP. The TPP is emblematic of the great struggle of our time, the people against transnational corporations which want to loot and plunder the planet. The people will not allow this to happen. We have stopped giant agreements like this before by coming together across borders to fight back. 
This week, there will be more than 30 actions in the U.S. and actions in Argentina, Canada, Chile, New Zealand, and Peru. In mid-February, when members of Congress are home, people are organizing ways to pressure them. And we are already making plans for the next mass mobilization. We must stop the TPP and other dangerous treaties like TTIP and TISA and build economic systems that are rooted locally and that lift up workers and protect communities all over the world. We must unite in global solidarity for justice. That gives me the feels. So there you have it, crawling out of that hole, moving past the mirage of freedom and getting shit done. For information on the rally happening this week in your city, go to flushthetpp.com slash actions. That's also where you can sign up for the newsletter and get more info on upcoming actions like the ones that Margaret mentioned. Now finally this week, let's target a low-life scum that you probably hadn't, haven't heard of, or in fact seen, but whose poisonous particles literally cover more than half of our country. You low-life scum. Now, if you've been peering past that gleaming facade of corporatized, propagandized bullshit for a while, then it should come as no surprise to you that there's some shit going on that the media isn't telling you about. Corporate media, that is. That your representatives don't want to talk about or do anything about. And I would certainly put myself in that category as well. But this one, this one even threw me. So, imagine an elementary school that's only a couple of hundred meters away from a pit emitting radiation that's four times as high as levels found in long-term evacuation zones directly outside of Fukushima. Now imagine that in South Dakota. The pit that I'm talking about is an open pit uranium mine and it is in fact 200 meters away from an elementary school and it is in fact emitting 1,770 micro-rems per hour, which, again, is in fact four times more than many red and orange evac zones around Fukushima. And yes, sorry to say, but there are about 169 uranium mines less than 40 miles away from Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills. Here's a gist. Back in the heyday of nuclear exploration, both in terms of energy and bombs, the government not only went on its own uranium digs, but urged private companies and even regular citizens to do so as well and made movies about it, apparently. Uh, they literally said, dig up some uranium and bring it. We'll pay you for it. So, between private people, businesses, and the government, there are now more than 15,000 abandoned uranium mines in the 15 western states. The exact number is a bit difficult to tell because, again, some are just like in people's backyards or in random spots around otherwise seemingly spotless landscapes. And therein lies another problem. Much like methane, which we've discussed before, radioactive dust is odorless. You can't see it. You can't point to a gust of wind and, on the plains and say, ooh, radioactive. You can't look at a glass of water and say, hmm, looks like radiation seeped into my water supply. But after whole communities experienced severe health issues, livestock and farming catastrophes, people began to investigate, and they started fighting. Fighting to seal these mines, fighting for real, straightforward, no bullshit legislation to end the poisoning of millions of people, animals, and natural resources. So far, the government response has been shitty. A uranium mine in South Dakota now displays a small warning sign telling people that they shouldn't spend more than a day a year in the area. Good to know. Thanks for the piece of shit sign. Meanwhile, three out of about 523 abandoned mines on Navajo land have been cleaned up. Three. Which brings up the other glaring point that many of these mines fall on Native American land, such as Navajo and the Great Sioux Nation. And while it's obvious from this and many other continued colonial escapades that the powers that be could really give a flying fuck about the well-being of natives, radioactive dust doesn't care what you look like or where you come from, whether this still is your land or someone else's. That shit affects everyone and everything. In fact, if you're breathing a sigh of relief because you're here on the East Coast, consider this. The uranium-rich soil that has been dug through and tossed around for the sake of nuclear endeavors has also been flung up into the air in the search of coal and oil. For example, the back and oil fields in North Dakota, the largest oil and gas deposit in the U.S., Guess what happens to fossil fuels that are dug up through uranium deposits, then sent off across the country to be burned? Yeah, the uranium gets burned with it. So if you live close to a coal-burning plant that gets any coal from the Midwest, which, spoiler alert, they do, there's a pretty damn good chance that you are getting some radioactive dust with your coal ash cocktail. And while the communities closest to these uranium pits are experiencing the highest levels of cancer in the country, 
And that's not to mention widespread miscarriages, birth defects, autoimmune disorders, respiratory and kidney disease. There is still no such thing as a safe level of radiation. There's no recommended daily dose to be drinking, breathing in, eating. These mostly native lower income and immigrant communities are literally seeing their people and planet fall apart under the invisible poison. But we outside the red zone, so to speak, aren't immune. Furthermore, there is currently no existing federal laws requiring the cleanup of open pit uranium mines and no corporate accountability, which is really no fucking surprise. This is why Clean Up the Mines and Defenders of the Black Hills are pushing for public awareness, outrage, and the Uranium Exploration and Mining Accountability Act of 2016. This act would establish a complete inventory of all existing abandoned uranium mining and exploratory sites. It would also authorize the EPA to develop action plans for site-specific reclamation of abandoned uranium mines and exploratory sites. Temporary closure or immediate remediation of operating uranium mines within the same watershed. Institute a program of public education on dangers of abandoned uranium mines. And finally, mandate accountability, enforcement, and public oversight to ensure cleanup of abandoned uranium mines. The scope of this issue is unbelievable. Consider the population of New York City, 8.4 million people. An estimated 10 million people live within 50 miles of a recorded mine, and that's a recorded mine. And as I said, in the age of dig, ship, and burn fossil fuels, contaminated water supplies, and the farming and meat industries also nestled in those areas, this is not a localized issue. If you ever wanted a fight against the invisible hand of corrupt and evil industry, this is definitely your fight. For more information on the Uranium Act, further facts and backstory, as well as other ways to get involved, visit cleanupthemines.org and defendblackhills.org. And that does it for this week's heavy dose of dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. As usual, check out the last slide to see all of the sites that I mentioned in this week's show. And be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From the Devil's Den. Good night and act out.